Okay, this is the first hour of physics 1B for December 8th. It's our last lecture. And uh, tonight we're going to be talking about some more details about sound and just finish up what we haven't done yet and then we'll be done. Okay, so um, let's zoom in a little bit here. Man, the cats outside my house are making all kinds of noise. It's very distracting. Okay, so what we want to talk about now are uh, standing waves. We've talked about standing waves in the past. We talked about standing waves on strings. Um, and we talked about how they can kind of explain the type of um, notes that can be produced by uh, guitars and um, pianos and other types of string instruments, right? But what about instruments like flutes and organs and oboes and things like this? So these, these things produce standing waves uh, in pipes or tubes or whatever you want to call it, basically wind instruments, okay? So the thing about um, pipes are that uh, when they produce standing waves, it depends on if uh, one end is opened or closed. So basically, when you have an open pipe, um, so that would be like a pipe that's open on both ends, or um, it might be it might be that one end kind of like goes down like this, but as long as there's uh, an opening on both ends. So open, then what happens is that the um, if the L is the length of the pipe, then the fundamental frequency occurs for um, V over 2L, and the nth frequency occurs for N times V over 2L. And then if you have a pipe that's closed at one end, so this is the this is the equation for the frequency for um, the pipe that is um, open. So I'll put it over here, open pipe. And then you have a, if you have a pipe that is closed at one end, so I don't really know how to draw that any different, but if you have a pipe where you blow into the pipe here, and then if it's closed over here, so I guess I could do that by doing something like this or something, I don't know. So this one's closed. Has to be open on one side so you can actually blow into it. Um, in this case, the nth frequency is NV over 4L. And you can also kind of figure out what the, what the, uh, the wavelengths are gonna be in this case too, because if you resolve this equation here, we know that velocity is equal to frequency times wavelength. So that means wavelength is equal to velocity divided by frequency. So in these equations over here, if I rewrite it like this, 2L over N is equal to uh, V over F sub N. So this is gonna give us lambda N. And same thing over here, if we write this one as, uh, let's see, V over F N, which is equal to lambda N, this one will be equal to 4L over N. So basically, if you want less to memorize, and you actually are the kind of person that wants to memorize things, the open pipe has the exact same standing waves and wavelengths as um, the wave on a string. So it's exactly the same. The only difference is that for the pipe that's closed, you get this, there's a one half of it that occurs here. That's pretty much it. Anyone have any questions? Okay. So let us solve this problem that's right here. It says, on a day when the speed of sound is 345 meters per second, the fundamental frequency of a particular stopped organ pipe, so stopped is gonna be like closed, so this could also be stopped, depends on how you wanna, wanna put it, uh, is 220 hertz. So F, it says the fundamental frequency, right, which is equal to N1, so that means F1, is equal to two, oops, 220 two hertz. Question A says, how long is this pipe? Well, it's pretty easy. Look at this equation here. If we say F1 is equal to V over 2L, then V over 2 times F1 is going to be equal to um, the length. So that's going to be 3, 4, 5 meters per second divided by 
2 times the frequency. By the way, a pipe that's closed at one end, a really good example of this would be like, if you take like a Coke bottle or a beer bottle or something and you, it's, it's empty and you blow across the top of it, you know, you can produce sounds. And depending on how you know long the model is, you'll get different sounds. That's basically what this says. There's something else you can do where like, suppose that I have like a Coke bottle, okay? And that looks awful. And you're blowing across, you're blowing air across the top of the Coke bottle, right? Um, the length in this case, let's suppose there's some fluid in there. If there's still some fluid down here, so there's like liquid or water or whatever is down here, then the length will be the distance down to here. So for example, let's say that you have a soda bottle, you take a few sips and now that the, now the level's at this point, you blow across the top, you'll get a certain sound. If you then drink some more so that the water level moves down to another level, that's gonna extend the length, right? What happens to the frequency then? Does the question make sense? So you drink a little bit more of your, your liquid inside of here and then you blow across the top again. What's gonna happen to the frequency? Is it gonna go up or down? If L is the distance from the top to the top of the water. What's gonna happen according to this equation? If L goes up, what happens to frequency? It goes down, right? So that means that it is going to sound deeper pitched, right? You can try this yourself next time you're drinking a beer, or drinking a soda or something like that. And, uh, you know, take a drink, blow across the top of it, take another drink, blow across the top of it. And then as you continue to drink and keep blowing across the top of it, it should be the case that the sound gets deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. So, all right, what's this equal to? Can you all calculate that for me? Three, four, five divided by four, four, zero. I think my phone's in my other room. Oh no, it's not, it's right. You'd think after all these years of teaching physics that I would just buy a calculator, right? But no. 0.784. I got the same thing. All right, so 0.784 m over s. That's going to be our length, not meters per second. What am I talking about? Just meters. Okie doke. Part B, the second overtone of this pipe has the same wavelength as the third harmonic of an open pipe. How long is the open pipe? Okay, so it says the second overtone of this pipe has the same wavelength as the third harmonic of an open pipe. How long is the open pipe? All right, so second overtone, what does that mean n is equal to? Two. Three. Oh, that's harmonic. So harmonic, yeah. So overtone is where you have to add one. So it's three. That means that, well, we know L, right? So we can find the wavelength from here because then lambda sub three should be equal to four times the length divided by three. So I get 1.0543 meters. That's my lambda three. And it says, this is the same wavelength as the third harmonic of an open pipe. Well, for the open pipe, then that's still gonna be n equal to three. And my wavelength for the open pipe is lambda sub n here is equal to two L over n. So two times L, which we don't know, this is, we're gonna call this L prime, I guess, for the second pipe, divided by the wavelength uh, in. Okay, so now we just solved this for L prime. So we're gonna get L prime is equal to um, N times lambda three, or we'll actually just put the numbers in. So it's gonna be three times lambda three divided by um, two. So three halves of this, so that means L prime is gonna be um, that times, oh, what's wrong with me? It's not, this isn't right. It's 1.045, there we go. So if we do three halves times that, then we get 1.568.
Okay. You'll agree. You know what I realized? We uh we did this first part wrong. It says it's a stopped organ pipe, and I used the wrong equation. I should have used this equation. So this right here was supposed to be a four, four, four. Sorry about that. That should have been a four, a four, and a four, which means this answer is wrong. It should have been 0.392. Point three nine two. And then for the second one, I think I did this one right actually. Yeah, four all over three. So that part we got right. I got the second part wrong. What did I do wrong? What? Oh. I guess overtones are different. I've literally never taught this before, so it's not surprising I got it wrong. They're saying that the third overtone, wait. It says the second overtone is the third possible frequency, which they're saying is n equal to five. Because apparently in this equation here for the stopped pipe, n can only take the values of one, three, five, seven. This other equation, n can be equal to one, two, three, etc. But what they're saying is that the second overtone here is actually going to be n equal to five. So this should have been a five down here, which means that the answer would be four divided by five times one. Well, then this is wrong too because we use the wrong length. So this is then going to be three nine two. We'll just erase these since they were wrong. So we do four divided by five times 0.392. What am I doing? So I got 0.3136. And then if we plug that in here for lambda three, it's still gonna be n equal to three because it's the third harmonic of the open pipe. And for the open pipe, one, two, three like this, that works just fine. So our answer then should be three halves times this. So 0.47, is that right? Yeah, okay, that's right. <laughs> ah, sorry, um, okay, does anyone have any questions? Mm. So for a closed mm. pipe and an open pipe, and N is fixed for those, so for an open pipe, N can only be one, two, three. Like, second harmonic would be seven. No, 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 no. It can be one, two, three, four, etc. Yeah. It can be anything. Any any whole number. This is, and then for the for this one, it's only odd numbers. Gotcha. So, like, um, for example, second harmonic would be, for an open pipe, would be two, right? Well, three, actually. And then... Maybe. Maybe, yeah, maybe. Let me see. From the way they're saying it, it says the second, fourth, and all even harmonics are missing. So I think that in terms of the language, when they say harmonic, it's still going to mean the same thing for an op for a stop pipe. But the overtone thing is the part that's going to be different. My God, that's confusing. That's just incredibly confusing, isn't it? Anyway. I don't think I gave you that many problems with these things. So hopefully it's not too confusing and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be that confusing on a final, I don't think. On the on your next test. Anyway, alright, let's move on to something that I that I have taught before and I do understand. Um, we're gonna talk about interference, wave interference. We 
We've actually already talked a little bit about this. Okay. So we know that waves have these things called like, you know, peaks and troughs or crests and troughs. And if we have two waves that are traveling in the same medium and they inter they interact with each other, so there's two waves that are traveling in the same medium and you want to evaluate what the the total wave is at one point, then you basically just have to add the amplitudes of the waves. Oh wait, wait, wait. wait. Kate, what did you say? Why? Oh, I missed your question. I'm sorry. Why is wavelength 4 over 3L? Did I answer that as I was going through? Four thirds L. Looks like I changed it. Was it here? Here. You were asking here why that was the wavelength? Yeah. It's from that equation right there. Okay. So you salt basically oh, yeah, just that makes sense. okay, cool. Um, all right. Um, right. So two waves traveling the same medium from different sources. When you look at a point, if you want to find the total wave at a point, you have to add the two. Um, you have to add the two waves. So suppose that you have. I'll draw it over here. Suppose that I have a speaker here. So I have speaker A and I have speaker B, right? So two different speakers. And each one of them is producing sound waves, okay? And I go to some position, let's say that is exactly in between them, like right dead in between them. Okay, so it's the exact same distance to here and the exact same distance to here. Okay, so if those two distances are the same, we call this the path length. So let's say I call this one R1 and I call this one R2, right? So if R2 minus R1 is equal to zero, then what's gonna happen is you're gonna get what's called constructive interference. We call it constructive because you're gonna get kind of an amplification of sound, so to speak. Oh, and I left one other thing out here. Both of these speakers are just producing one frequency. So they're both producing exactly the same frequency. And so what happens is, the way I like to think about it is, imagine we think about a wave that's traveling on this thing right here, right? And it goes up and down and it goes up and down. And, it goes, and really, what I'm drawing here is like pressure amplitudes. And let's say that by the time it gets to this point, it's at a maximum. So right when it gets to here, it's at a maximum, right? So that's maximum. And then the other wave, going at the exact same frequency and in sync with the other one, it comes down here and it also reaches a maximum. So both the waves hit a maximum right when it gets to this point right here. What happens then is that the total amplitude of the wave is going to double. And that's what we call constructive interference. Okay, And it will happen if R2 minus R1 is 0 or if R2 minus R1 is equal to a whole number multiple of the wavelength of the wave. Okay, And the reason why is because even if we put this speaker exactly one wavelength behind here, so we start, the, start at one wavelength behind, then it's still going to basically produce exactly the same wave, right? Like we move the speaker backwards so that it was one wavelength behind like this, then it would still be able to produce exactly the same um, uh, form of a wave that would eventually constructively interfere at this point right here. Okay, so this is constructive interference. Same thing, constructive interference. If R2 minus R1 is a whole number multiple, so n has to be equal to 0, 1, two, three, etc. All right, does that make sense? Why the two waves would add together if they're exactly whole number multiples apart, does that make sense? Okay, so to get destructive interference, destructive interference is gonna occur when one wave is at its crest and one wave is at its trough so that you have a positive amplitude and a negative amplitude and then they'll just cancel each other out, okay? In terms of pressure waves, the idea would be that if I have a high pressure region and a low pressure region of a wave, that overlap with each other, well, the pressure is just kind of average out to zero, right? It's not that the pressure is actually zero, but the the relative pressure to atmospheric pressure, right? So, um, but I still think it's kind of easier to think of it as actual waves. For destructive interference, if R2 minus R1 is equal to a, um, to n lambda over two, 
let's see, it doesn't exactly work. It's not exactly in lambda over two, is it? It's more like, I think it's n plus half lambda. Let's try that. Let's try n plus half lambda. n plus one half lambda. I think this works. Because then n can be equal to zero, one, two, three. I don't have to. And this will be destructive interference. So this would mean the two waves are out of phase by exactly one half of a wavelength. Okay. So it's key that both of the sources are producing uh, the same frequency, but suppose we come over to some new point right here, right? And now I draw a line to here, and I draw a line to here, right? And I say this is my R1, and I say this is my R2. If the difference in path between R2 and R1 is exactly a half integer multiple of the wavelength, then you're going to get destructive interference. And destructive interference means that, in principle, now whether this really happens in real life is another thing, if you sat here and you were, you were, you were experiencing destructive interference, then what you would hear is you'd hear no sound or very, very low sound, okay? So the thing is that over here it would be loud and over here it would be quiet, basically, is the idea. If this is constructive interference and this is destructive interference, the idea would be if it's if the two waves are perfectly in sync, it would literally sound like nothing. Now, <laughs> it's really hard for this to happen in real life because if you look, so like in my room right here, I have two speakers on either side of my TV, okay? And I could, I could turn on music, and I could have them just playing their music. I could have them, and, you know, I could even set them up to play just one constant tone if I wanted to, right? And then I could walk around my room, and I could be like, hey, maybe I can find the places where I see contract interference and destructive interference. The problem is it's not that simple, because when you have speakers in a real room that are producing sound, the sound bounces off all the walls, too. You know what I mean? So in order to truly experience this, you'd have to be in a very, very open, like like maybe a big gymnasium or something like that. And then you'd have to have your two speakers and you'd have to be relatively close to them. And even in a really big gymnasium, they're still gonna be echoing off the walls and stuff like that. So I think this is pretty hard to experience, but I will say that this concept of constructive and destructive interference, when you take physics uh, 1D, um, you, will, you will be able to see this because the same phenomenon happens with light. And with light, it's much easier to produce this phenomenon because light doesn't bounce off walls unless they're really reflective. You know what I mean? So if you have two light sources, like a laser beam and a laser beam here, uh, then, you can, then you can make this happen. Go out to a field and throw your own concert, right? It is in principle possible for it to happen outdoors. That is probably true. If you, if you so, now, if you go to a concert, there's usually lots of speakers, so you're never going to have this happen, but if there were really only two speakers and they were producing exactly the same sound, which doesn't always happen, right? Because if you listen to, like, stereo music, right, you listen to music that has two different inputs, left and right, then the sound in your left ear and your right ear are never the same, right? Uh, but uh, anyway, so this is interference. It is an incredibly important property of waves that they can interfere with themselves. And I say that because it's something that particles cannot do, you know? Particles can't do this. You know, we talk about waves, we talk about things like velocity. Particles can have velocities, right? We talk about, um, you know, how, how loud they are and pitch and stuff like that. Particles cannot interfere with themselves. At least we think they can. Um, and it's a huge, huge part of Physics 1D to understand these interference phenomena that occur and I'm just going to show you kind of a, a picture of something that's supposed to, this is supposed to kind of help you. I don't know how well it does. So right here, what we have are two different waves that are being produced um, by, let me turn one of them off. So we've got waves. Yeah, you, 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 it, there could be more. Yeah. In fact, what you're going to, what you're going to do in physics 1D is you'll look at what happens when you have like five waves interfering with each other or when you have like N waves interfering with each other through what's called a diff diffraction grating. Uh, yeah, of course waves can transfer energy. Absolutely. Yeah. Just think about it. Go stand by the ocean and listen to the waves crash onto the ocean. There's definitely energy there, right? Definitely energy. And, uh, yeah, always transfer energy. Sound is a form of energy. Light is a form of energy. And it's a wave. Um, and you know what else? All matter is actually waves. Everything that we think is a particle is actually a wave. 
So everything's a wave, man. So, yeah. Okay, so here we've got this little droplet of water that's going in here. Life is a wave. Catch it. All right, yeah. Um, so the the drops are coming in here. We have these these patterns here, right? So what's going to happen is I'm going to have another source that's also going to be producing sound waves and watch what happens. Or water waves. Oh, wait. Why didn't it? Did I turn it off? There it goes. Okay, there we go. So two waves, same frequency. You can tell that they have the same frequency because the source is dropping a drop every single time at exactly the same time. And now if you look along this line right here, right? Look along this line right here. Look along this line right here. Those are the places where interference is occurring. In fact, along this entire line right here, there's destructive interference. And there's destructive interference because one of the waves is at a maximum and the other wave is at a minimum at exactly that same time. Here in the middle, right along the middle here, you can see that these waves, it's hard to tell, but the individual crest here is bigger than, than one of them. In fact, can we go sideways on this one? Eh, not really. But uh, you would have constructive interference right here in, this, in the center. Now let me, uh, let me show you what happens with light. Here's the interference. Does this one go to light? There we go. Okay, so there's two light beams. And these have much higher frequency. So look what happens here. Isn't that cool? These are destructive interference patterns right here. In between, those are constructive, 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 constructive. And right here where it's all gray looking, that's destructive. Black represents a trough. Green represents a crest. So gray, or greenish gray, or whatever you want to call this, uh, this, this color in between green and black here, that's where the destructive interference is occurring. Does that make sense? And what you'll see when you do this in You'll do a lab, maybe more than one lab. In physics, uh, what determines how many constructive, destructive segments are created? I guess just how big the region that you're looking at here. So with sound, when there is destructive interference, those places. That's what we think, Andrew, yes. There's a science museum I went to when I was a kid that's in Oklahoma, and I, I know there's a place like this here in California too, um, where it's like a, like a kid science museum. And I've definitely seen it happen in person, where someone set up an experiment where you can prove that this happens. It's really weird. It's very strange. Anyway, um, yeah, this is what you actually see though. Because right here, this is destructive interference because, and you get a dark spot. Right here in the middle, you get constructive interference, and right here you get this. How many destructive segments are created? So what exactly do you mean? Like, like this area right here or this area right here by segments? What do you mean by segments? Can you clarify? Um, we can also change the pattern that's produced over here. Oh, like how many of these there are going to be? Uh, it depends on how fast the waves are traveling and the wavelength. So if we change the wavelength by going like this, you can see that there's now more, right? Because that what I did was I made the wavelength, I think, smaller. I think it's smaller now, right? Yeah, it's smaller. Yeah. If we go this way, it will be less because the wavelength is much uh, fatter, right? So there's less room. So really, that's a good question. I like, I'm glad you asked that. I think I like this. This one has a ton. For, um, for light, of course, um, frequency is color. And for sound, frequency is pitch, right? So also, the closer together these get, I think we'll get even more. If we put them really close together here, we should get even more of the bands. Or maybe not, actually. Maybe we'll get less. Yeah, you'll learn, it. You'll learn about why that is when you take uh, physics 1D. Okay, here's the other thing that's really cool. So um, the main way we actually do this is by using slits. So this is what you're going to look at in physics 1, uh, 1D. You have light that's produced and you pass the light through a slit and the slit basically kind of makes it so that it's its own source and you still get these, these patterns like this. So we call this the double slit experiment. It is one of the most exper most important experiments in the history of physics. It has been repeated over and over and over again. And remarkably, uh, we thought we knew everything about it in the 1830s. And then we, it turns out that we started doing the same thing. We started shooting electrons through this double slit thing. And uh, it is the double slit experiment. Yes, that's what this is, Jacob. Um, at least what I'm looking at here. I don't know when you asked your question. But yeah, so 
the really, really, truly remarkable thing occurs when instead of using light or sound or water, you do the same thing with electrons. You fire electrons through slits like this. They actually fire them through crystals. And electrons also create these, um, these patterns, these interference patterns here, which is one of the first proofs we had that the electron, even though we think it's a particle, is actually a wave. So, yeah. Anyway, so um, let's look at a problem here that we can solve using this, these, these concepts. Okay, so um, here what we have is two small loudspeakers, A and B, are driven by the same amplifier and emit pure sinusoidal waves that are in phase. For what frequencies does constructive interference occur at point P? For what frequencies does destructive interference, interference occur? The speed of sound is 350, so we're gonna use a speed of sound that's 350, I'm going to draw a different version of this picture here so it's a little easier to understand. So we've got our two speakers, and they're separated by two and three, so I'll put a dot like right about there and say this is speaker B, and this is speaker A, this is 2M, this is 1M, and then four meters away, so we need another line that we're going to draw starting from here out this way. It's going to be four meters, so this is four meters, and here's our point P. So now if I draw a line from speaker B to P. Ugh. No. I'll just use my mouse. And then we go and draw a line from speaker A to P. And then we'll call this one R sub B or something. We'll call this one R sub A. And what we're interested in is the path difference, R A minus R B. And specifically, it says, for what frequencies does constructive interference occur? Well, we know that constructive interference will occur if RA, B, RA minus RB is equal to N times lambda. So in this case, we're solving for lambda, but what we really want is frequency for what frequencies, right? So let's replace, we'll use V equal to lambda times F, which means that lambda is V over F. So this will be N V over F is equal to RA minus RB. And then F would be equal to N V over RA minus RB. And by the way, this, this we just want absolute value for this. We don't care if it's positive or negative. Um, so that means that frequency should be equal to N times V so V is 350 and RA minus RB. So RA is 4 squared plus 12 squared. Or, so it's the square root of that. And RB is the square root of 4 squared plus one squared, because we have a right triangle right here and here, like that. So, and we want absolute value. Although we don't need it because the first one is actually bigger. So F is equal to then all these things times N. So 350 divided by I get 1,003, so I get N times 1,003 hertz. So basically, the frequency is any integer multiple, so as long as N is equal to 0, 1, 2, 3, etc., then that is our answer. So at 1,000, if they were putting, if these two speakers were, were um, outputting a, a sound uh, that had a frequency of 1,003 hertz, then this would be a destructive interference, constructive interference spot. Constructive. Does that make sense? Anyone have any questions?
for what frequencies does destructive interference occur? To get destructive interference, we need to make it so that the path difference RA minus RB is equal to N plus half times lambda. So basically we can use the exact same equation that we had from above, but we just need to replace the N with N plus half. So let's take this whole thing right here. Let's copy it, put it right here, and then just replace this with n plus half, and then we'll get our answer, which is going to be, you know, exactly the same. Oops, one too many zeros. And that's our answer. This will be destructive. So this is destructive. This is constructive. Does that make sense? Did we get it right? Yeah, we got it right. Yeah, and they say in this problem as well, this effect may not be strong in an ordinary room because of reflection will not only will it not be strong, it won't it won't ever happen. You will never ever experience this. So I don't I don't want you to feel like you can go and try this out at your house. You just absolutely cannot. Um, it, 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 we're talking about it mostly to just it's really strange too because this section is so short in this textbook. I know in the other textbooks that I've used in the past, they actually go through quite a bit of discussion about what's going on here. But this section is just so incredibly short in this textbook. And I don't, I don't really know why it's so short, to be honest. Um, because interference is just one of the most, one of the things that makes us know we're, we're talking about waves is the fact that they can interfere. That That's actually historically the reason why people kind of knew that light was a wave in 1820 was because they did this double slit experiment and the only way you can understand the double slit experiment is if the thing that's happening is waves and you know there was a lot of debate about is light a wave or is it a particle because like newton had this idea that light was a particle and huygens who was a danish scientist christian huygens um had this whole idea that light was a wave and both theories were really good at describing all the known phenomenon phenomena until the double slit experiment occurred and they realized oh wait light is a wave so they used to think it was a particle or a wave then they were like no it is a wave and then of course einstein comes along and proves that it's a particle so now we think that it's a particle and a wave so just keep things really confusing for you all all right i think we're gonna take a break no we're not gonna take a break we're just gonna keep on going because we have time and this last section is gonna take quite a while so if you have two random walkie talkies you happen to get the same frequency the other would you be able to listen in well, that's a different idea. I mean, when, you, when you're listening to a... You're, you're right, you would be able to listen in. If you're listening to a walkie-talkie, right, um, and you're on a certain frequency, um, really what's, what's happening there is the two walkie-talkies are, are tuned to the same frequency so that when they send out radio waves, they don't send out sound waves, they send out radio waves, which is light, like light, similar to light waves. It is light waves. Um, those waves are transmitted on that frequency so it's it's not it's not quite the same same deal but you are correct that if you had some walkie talkies and you tuned yours and i mean this is how it works like if you've ever driven in a car that has a cb radio has anyone ever you ever talked to the truckers on the cb radio before some of you must have before you're driving across the country or something you have yeah yeah it's the same concept right when you're on a cb radio there's just different channels and the different channels correspond to different frequencies that you're that you're talking to someone on, and um, it's pretty fun. Uh, is that something people do? So truckers have these CB radios, and they talk to each other on them as they're driving around the country, right? Uh, just because you know, I mean, it's nice to have someone to talk to when you're in a car when you're driving long trips and stuff like that. But when did I have? I don't know. It's certain cars I've been in in the past. Some people just have CB radios, and you can totally just sit there and talk to the truckers. It's it's really fun. They're fun people. Truckers are awesome. Um, anyway, so I, it is something people do. At least, pe at least people from Oklahoma do this. <laughs> I don't know about. I'm sure people in California do too. I'm sure they do. Um, yeah, it's been a long time. Your car is a '97, and sometimes when cars pass, I grab their radio. Um, like you hear their radio.
listen to what they're hearing. Huh. I don't know. I don't know why that would happen. It's interesting. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what that is, Andrew. That's more like your antenna is picking up. Well, it just means that hmm. I don't immediately know what's going on there, Andrew. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna try to speculate for now. But I'll think about it. Okay. Last topic for the semester: the Doppler effects. Have you all heard of this before? Probably have. Probably at some point you all have heard of the Doppler effect, right? Okay. Yeah, and two A for sure. But you probably heard about it before that too. Uh, where I come from in Oklahoma, we have, well, they have it here too. We were watching the news and they're like tracking storms and stuff like that, which doesn't happen very much around here, but it does happen that people will be tracking storms on the news. They usually use something called a Doppler radar. Have you all heard that before? Doppler radar? Yeah, no, maybe not. Uh, anyway, so uh, certainly if you go somewhere where like, let's say you go to a, like go skiing here around here, one of the, and you know, watching the news in those areas, you definitely would see it. So works off the same principle. Um, uh, the Doppler effect is the idea that when something is producing a sound and it's moving towards you, it will sound higher pitched. When something is producing a sound and it's moving away from you, it will sound lower pitched. That's in and of itself, or in effect, what the Doppler effect is. And I've got a video here for this. So we're going to switch this over because this is something you need to be able to hear. You can't hear it unless I switch windows. So we're going to go to this. We are not going to watch this whole video because it has a bunch of junk in it. And all I want you to do is to hear this. So we're going to rewind just a little bit here until the train's coming towards us. And all I want you to do is to listen to this. All of you have heard this before in your life, I guarantee you. Whether you thought about it or not, you have absolutely heard this. It happens every day when I go outside my house and I hear a car driving down the road. It has a certain pitch. And then when it passes me, the pitch changes. It is so distinct that I can tell without looking left or right when I go to my street, I know if cars are approaching me or if they're going away from me. You know what I mean? Like I can tell just from the sound of the tires hitting the road, I know exactly if the car's approaching me or if it's going away from me. It's really, really easy to tell. Also very easy to tell with cop cars or ambulances or fire, fire, like fire trucks. Like when you pull over to the side of the road and a fire truck zips by you with its like horn blaring, when it's coming towards you, it's going to sound really high pitch. And then the moment it passes you, the pitch changes instantly the moment it's moving away from you. So let's see if we can hear that here. We're going to be listening to the sound of the train as it, as it comes in here. So just listen. I apologize. It's playing through my speakers. I don't know if... I'll, I'll mute my speakers so you can't hear it. We'll do it again. We'll do it one more time because I don't know if there was an echo there or not. Oop, a little bit too far back. There we go. Here we go. Listen to one more too. Are you all able to hear it? Just at the moment, the moment it passes by, you instantly hear the pitch change. Do you all agree? Were you all able to hear it in the video? Yeah, right here. Okay. And it's not the volume changing, it's not the loudness changing because it's getting farther away from you. No the actual pitch that's being produced absolutely changes. And the reason why, of course, is because this thing's moving, which means that the sound wave that it produces when it's coming towards you is going faster than the sound wave it produces when it's going away from you. Because the sound wave adds the velocity of the train to the velocity of sound. So let's say that a train's coming, let's say that, let's use simple numbers. If a train approaches you at 350 meters per second, let's, whoops. Let's use 50. Let's say that a train is approaching you at 50 meters per second. That's about 100 miles an hour, right? Then the sound wave that's coming from the train is going to be approaching you at 400 meters per second, right? If the speed of sound is about 350 and the train's moving at 50, you add them together when it's coming towards you, and now the sound is coming towards you at a speed of 400 meters per second. When they pass you and the train's going away, now the sound's coming towards you, but you have to subtract the train's speed. 
So if it's going away at 50 meters per second and the sound's coming towards you at 350 minus 50 at 300, that's the reason why it's different is because when it's coming towards you, the sound is coming at you faster than it normally is. When it's going away from you, the sound is going away from you slower than it is. And that's, that's pretty much what the Doppler effect is. I'm gonna write an equation down right here. Your book goes through like a bunch of different equations and I don't, I don't know, every book does this. I'm just gonna give you the equation, okay? So suppose that I have a person, okay? And I say that this person has a velocity I'm still on YouTube, Professor. Oh, thank you so much. Let's go back over here. We'll click screen. We'll click change windows. And then OBS. Go. All right, here we are. So suppose that I have a person, and let's say they're on a skateboard, and they're moving in this direction. Um, skateboard. They're moving in this direction with a velocity that I'm going to call the velocity of... I'm, I'm going to use a different... Uh, I'm going to use a different... Um, Notation that your book, leaves. I don't like the one your book uses. We're going to call this O. So O is going to stand for observer. So this is O. O is observer. And then let's say that I have a car that's blowing its horn. Okay, so I've got a car, it's blowing its horn, so it's sending out sound waves, right? And the car is traveling in this direction with a velocity that I'm going to call V sub S. So S is going to stand for source. Okay. And now what we're going to do is we're going to say that this car is producing a frequency that we're going to call F sub S. This is the frequency of the sound that's coming out here. Okay. So F as, FS is the frequency of the source. VS is the velocity of the source. And what we're interested in is what does the observer hear? And the observer is going to hear a sound with a frequency F0 that's going to be equal to, let's see if I can get this off the top of my head. It is velocity of sound plus, oh, 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 we have that, that's where, it, we'll use V. So V is just gonna be sound velocity. Sound velocity. Okay, I believe what's gonna happen is it's gonna be V plus VS divided by V minus VO FS. Then I'm gonna look down and see if I got it right. Oh, they have, oh, they, oh. I hate the way they do this. Yeah, we're going to use this one, but I think this is. Your book actually has a different version than the other books I've taught. I'm really surprised. Okay, I got these backwards. I think it is plus and minus, though. The source is on the bottom, and the observer is on the top. Let me just look at their, their uh, plus L, if, if plus L, if towards S, minus if opposite. Plus L if towards S. Now I'm wondering if their equation's even correct. Doesn't look right. V plus V O. Whew, I'm getting confused. This book sucks, by the way. I know I've told you all that before, but here on the last day of class, I just want to remind you how, how terribly awful this book is and how I really want to replace it with this book, which is way better. Um, here. Doppler effect. VO and VS. So I got it right. VO and VS. V plus VO review. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I'm reading what's in the book, and I, I, I legitimately think this is actually incorrect. I don't, unless I'm misunderstanding something. I don't, it, it absolutely looks incorrect to me. I, I'm very confused. I look at this during the break, but I don't understand at all what this equation is saying. It looks, it looks like it would lead you astray. Okay, well, anyway, here's our equation. And to use this equation, you want to think about this setup right here, where VO is going to be positive when, what's the way to put in this? When the observer moves towards the source and negative otherwise.
I see your question, Jake. I'm going to answer it in a second. And then Vs is positive when observer moves. Oh, when, sorry, when source moves towards observer and then negative and moving away. Okay, what is your question? Oh, I scroll down a little bit because I, here we'll do is we'll go function 11 and now it's not really blocking it off anymore. Is there an equation using the V Vs, what is that with the two bars around it? To account for if the car is going towards or where are those two holding? Right. D did I answer that, Ryan? With the, uh, we're going to, we'll do some examples. It'll be more clear, I think, what's going on, but yeah, I think I could. Okay. So that's your equation with the Doppler effect. The book has like three different equations, and I think all of them are wrong. Well, maybe two of them are right, but the point is when they move towards each other, right, then the velocity of sound is effectively increased. It's increased on the top and it's in, it's kind of increased on the bottom if you think about it because the way this equation works, right, is that when the numerator, um, well, first of all, what happens when VO and VS are zero? You just get F observer is equal to FS, right? When VO and VS are both positive, then you're gonna get an effect that uh, the frequency that the observer sees um, is going to be bigger, okay? Now, I can give you an example of something that's, I think, a little bit easier to understand in terms of this, instead of trying to imagine what's happening with sound waves. So I like to use water waves just because, you know, when I was growing up, I spent a lot of time on lakes around Oklahoma, and um, water waves are just much easier to understand because you can see them, right? So imagine that I have a wave in the water, right? And it's got some frequency, right? So I've got a water wave right here, right? And now imagine what happens if I'm just sitting here in a boat. Okay, I'm sitting here in a boat and I'm sitting still and a water wave comes across my boat, right? Now, what's gonna happen when the, the boat hits the, what, what's gonna happen when the boat hits the wave? Well, if the waves are going like this, right? The boat is gonna start bouncing up and down, right? Can you all imagine that? A bunch of waves come across, boat starts to bounce up and down. This happens any time like a big, if a big boat was to pass by in this direction, it would create waves that would cause this boat to basically bounce up and down from its wake. Can you all imagine that? Is that pretty clear? Bouncing up and down. So the frequency of the waves that you experience is related to how frequently your boat goes up and down, right? So let's say your boat is going up and down three times every second, okay? So it goes up and down like this three times every second. So the frequency is three hertz, right? Now what happens if we start to go in this direction on our boat? Are we going to experience a larger frequency of the wave setting us or a smaller frequency of the wave setting us? If we, if we, if we travel directly into the waves, is our boat going to go up and down faster or slower? Faster. Faster, right? Because now the waves just hit us more frequently because we're going into the waves. And obviously if we went away from the waves, they wouldn't hit us as frequently, right? So maybe when we travel into the waves, if it was three hertz before, now maybe it's five hertz. And when we go away from it, maybe it's one hertz. Does that make sense? And then you can also get the same ideas. Suppose the source of the waves is moving. And that's the Doppler effect. That's how it works. It's a really important effect, and it's used in all kinds of different ways. Um, like I said before, it's used as a way to, to track storms. Um, it's also used as a way to track your speed. So a radar gun um, that a cop uses to track your speed, what happens is that the radar gun shoots a beam of light at your car, the light very quickly travels to your car and then is reflected back by the gun where the gun detects it. And what the gun actually does is it doesn't actually detect your speed. It detects the change in frequency that occurs when that light beam goes out and hits your car. Because when the light beam goes out and hits your car, it gets reflected back off of your car. Your car becomes the source and it's going to have an effect on changing the frequency of the light when it comes back. And based on the change in frequency of the light, the gun reverse solves for velocity of source. Does that make sense? I'll give you I'll give you a picture of this, I guess. So here's radar gun, right? Here's your car. Horrible car. Car traveling in this direction. We're gonna call this the velocity of the source. What happens is the radar gun sends out waves, right? The waves hit your car, 
boom, they hit, and then they reflect off of your car, back into the th into the gun, okay? And there's gonna be a change in frequency that occurs, and what's gonna happen is that the observed frequency here now, okay, uh, the gun is not moving, okay? But the observed frequency here now is gonna be equal to the velocity of light divided by V minus Vs. Actually, the equation's a little bit different, but let's pretend it's the same for a second. It's crazy how light doesn't lose information uh, as there is a sun beaming outside. It is kind of crazy, right? Uh, and it's because, uh, you know, light, um, well, it turns out that the sun beating down actually is what illuminates everything around it to produce all the other light. Anyway, so what happens now is that the frequency observed uh, by, the, by the cop is going to be changed. And then you can basically figure out exactly what this is. So that's how a radar gun works. It just it works off the Doppler effect pretty much. It's pretty cool. Um, yeah. Anyway, so let's look at some problems. We'll probably have to take a break right now and we'll do the problems when we come back. Yeah, perfect time. Okay, I'm gonna put the first problem up here on the board so you can look at it during the break if you want to. But here's all the problems we're gonna do. All of these. Doppler effect one, Doppler effect two, and then three, four. So we'll do this one first. We'll do the rest of them. All right, let's take a break. <laughs> 